I want to begin by quoting the Quran, the book of God, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God exalted and transcended is He. He speaks directly to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He says, Alam nashrah laka sadarak. Have we not expanded for you your courage, which is an idiomatic phrase, meaning, have we not made you courageous? And removed the burden which was weighing you down on your back. And have we not uh, raised your remembrance or exalted your name? So it's reported in a hadith, this is a prophetic tradition of Al Hakim, that Adam, peace be upon him, Adam alayhi salam, when he was uh, asking God for forgiveness, uh, he was taught special words of inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from God, transcendent and exalted is he. Of course, Adam did not commit a conscious sin according to our uh, prophetology. A prophet cannot consciously disobey God. But he had been deluded by Satan and he forgot the command. So he ate of the tree and nonetheless, he is in a state of repentance to God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَتَلَقَى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ that he had learned words of inspiration from his Lord, so then God relented towards him or forgave him. And according to this hadith, which is related by Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, Adam said, for the sake of Muhammad, forgive me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fataba alayhi, forgave him. Right? And then God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, manifested himself in no anthropomorphic type of way, uh, without any type of modality. And he said to Adam, how do you know of Muhammad? And he said, well, when you created me and blew into my nostrils of your ruh, of your spirit, again, in no anthropomorphic type of way, uh, I opened my eyes and I saw written on the arsh, on the throne, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Muhammad is the messenger or the apostle of God. And I knew that you wouldn't put anyone's name next to yours unless they were extremely beloved to you. And then God said to him, yes, this is my beloved. If I would not have created him, I would not have created the cosmos. So my question to many Muslims is that when we know the name of the prophet is written on the throne and that God has said, have we not exalted your name? What could any one person possibly do to compromise that about the Prophet, peace be upon him. No one can, no one can touch his rank. He's untouchable. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It's like one of my teachers, he used the analogy of dogs barking at the moon, right? Because the Prophet oftentimes is compared to the moon and a lot of devotional poetry about him, peace be upon him. So when dogs are barking at the moon, does it affect the moon? The beauty of the moon as it traverses through the majestic sky? No, the moon doesn't even, it's not affected one iota by the barking of dogs, right? It continues to be beautiful. And for those of us on earth, the, dark, the, the barking of dogs is just white noise, right? It's just annoying. But nothing can touch his rank. So the name of the prophet is Muhammad. And this is on the second verbal form in Arabic. It's a form uh, denoting intensity or repetition. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a passive participle, meaning the one who is constantly praised. Right? Now, Muslims, one out of four human beings on earth is Muslim. And Muslims pray five times a day. So someone right now in the world is praying to God. A Muslim is praying to God 24-7. And Muslims in their prayers will send blessings of peace upon the Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him. So every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year of every decade of every century of every millennium 24-7 someone is sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And that's what's going on in the terrestrial realm. In the celestial realm we are told in the Quran Inna Allaha wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi That God himself, who is Allah, Rabbu samawati wal ard, khaliku kulli shay'in, the one who created everything, 
He is sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So what is our praising compared to his praising? Right? It's nothing. It's like putting a needle into an ocean and extracting the needle and comparing the ocean water with the water on the needle. It's nothing. When God praises the Prophet, what is our praise of him? Absolutely nothing. So these ad hominem attacks right, against the Prophet, peace be upon him, these are something, you know, these are things that don't surprise me. And if something is not surprising to me, it doesn't make me angry. Of course it concerns me. You know, I've, I have concern for the human condition. I can know why people are doing that. But if you expect someone to do something, how can it get you angry? How can it anger you? If you're uh, expecting to meet someone at 1 o'clock for lunch and they arrive on time, then that's fine. If they're late a half an hour, then you might become angry, but it's better to show patience. But if they call you in advance and they tell you, I'm going to be late a half an hour, so they show up half an hour late and then you get angry, your anger is not justified. Because why? Because you expect this type of thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that you will hear much from those who receive the book before you and those who associate partners with God. You're going to hear much from those who received previous dispensations like Jews and Christians and many other peoples that's going to annoy you. That's going to be offensive to you. Right? But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how to react in these situations. وَإِن تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا but to show patience and to show uh, self-restraint. This is the final, this is the best reaction. This is the determining factor in all affairs. That we show patience and we show self-constraint. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is reported to have said to his disciples in Matthew, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil about you falsely. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven that persecuted the prophets that came before you. So we have to understand that certain people have agendas. Since 2001, seven individuals were paid a total of $42 million to denigrate Islamic sanctities. We'll get into more of that later, inshallah ta'ala. So there's a verse in the Quran which says, قُلْ لَا يَسْتُوِ الْخَبِيثُ وَالطَّيِّبُ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ كَثْرَةُ الْخَبِيثُ Say, and God is speaking in the first instance, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and by extension to all of us, say, they are not the same. Pure things and foul things, even though the sheer amount of the foul things might surprise you. وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ كَثْرَةُ الْخَبِيثُ Even though the... the the amount of these foul things uh, might um, sway your judgment, potentially, right? So it's interesting because when our youth uh, go on the internet, the Google, whatever, and Yahoo, and they put in the name Muhammad, you have page after page after page after page of khaba'ith, of foulness, right? And this is very dangerous for youth because they don't know how to navigate, and many of them don't know how to have access to qualified scholarship. And this is something that's interesting. This is the kind of a genre of literature now, is these ad hominem attacks against the Prophet. And they're very good sellers, right? The truth about Muhammad, Islamic invasion. There's one called Prophet of Doom. There's one called The Psychology of Muhammad. The latest from Robert Spencer is Did Muhammad Exist? Right? This type of thing. I mean, these are things that we find in a bookstore, a whole genre of literature. And there's many things that aren't even reported by the American media that we read uh, about from over, overseas. For example, a very interesting thing. Uh, recently, a group of rabbis, they met in a place called Kiryat Arva, which is a, uh, a suburb of Hebron in Palestine. So it's called Khalil in Arabic. This is where Ibrahim or Abraham is buried. And they had a majlis. They had a gathering. What was the purpose of this gathering? was to send cursings or curse the Prophet Muhammad, la'an upon Muhammad wasallam. This was the whole purpose of the gathering, is to sit around and pronounce anathemas, to curse the Prophet. It's really strange, but this thing happens, this type of thing happens all the time. And it shouldn't surprise us, right? 
Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God tells us in the Quran that you should expect that to happen. You should expect that to happen. It doesn't touch the rank of the Prophet one iota. Not one iota. Allah is sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet, God himself. Nothing can touch his rank. Show patience and self-restraint. And then it says, Fattakullah. So fear God. Fear God, meaning according to the uh, exegetes of the Quran, to have self-restraint because violence is the language of the inarticulate. And no one was more articulate than the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said, I was given jawami'u al-kalim wa jawahiru al-hikam, comprehensive and articulate speech, dropping diamonds and pearls every time he opened his mouth. Ya ulil al-bab, the Quran says. O oh, people of al-bab. Al-bab is the plural of lub. Lub is the core or the seed or the kernel of something. So the heart has these four spiritual layers, the sadr, the qalb, the fu'ad, and then the lub. This is the place of intuitive, not discursive cognition. The seat of essential understanding and discernment. Real knowledge to preserve, to pre perceive the world as it is in reality. This is what happens in the lub. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is telling us, people of extreme intelligence, people of discernment, you should know that just because there's a proliferation of foul things, it doesn't make it true, right? You should be able to discern. So it's very important. Now there are three ways of looking at the Prophet. There's three ways of knowing according to our epistemology. The first way is by our senses, called al-hawas wal khams, our senses. And we know that our senses are extremely limited. So when you read something about the Prophet that's based on understanding him through the five senses, it's very dry. It's like reading a description of him in a history book. You know, names and dates and so on and so forth. But we know that our senses can also deceive us Right? There's the classic example of the four blind men touching four different parts of an elephant. Right? And then they're asked, what does an elephant look like? And one says, oh, he's very long like a snake because he touched the trunk. One says, he's very light and floppy because he touched the ear. And one said, oh, he's huge and he's fat because he touched the stomach. Who's right? None of them. Right? They're based, that's based on their senses. Even if they can look at the elephant, they're still limited. Because what's on the other side of the elephant? What's on the inside of the elephant? Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet in the Quran, وَإِن تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَى الْهُدَى لَا يَسْمَعُوا وَتَرَاهُمْ يَنْذُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ وَلَا يُبْسِرُونَ When you call them to guidance, they don't hear you. You see them looking at you, but they didn't see. You see them looking at you, but they don't see. Right? In other words, they're looking with basar, with their physical eyes, but the basira, the insight, the inner eye, is blind. Right? They have hearts by which they don't perceive. They have eyes by which they don't see. They have ears by which they don't hear. They're like cattle or even worse. They're heedless. Right? Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. This is from Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him, according to the New Testament Gospel. So when people look at the Prophet through their senses, like many of his generation did, like this man Abu Jahal, who hated the Prophet, right, and fought against the Prophet, when he looked at the Prophet, he said, what, this is Yatim Bani Hashim. This is, a, 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 he's an orphan from my clan, he's my neighbor. So he, he used to be a ra'i, he was a shepherd. So he's a Prophet now? Right? He's claiming to be a prophet. Why can't I be a prophet? Right? He's looking at the prophet through his senses. When certain Jewish elements in Galilee looked at Jesus, same type of thing. This is a carpenter, son of a carpenter. He's from a backwater town called Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Right? As Nathaniel says in John. Right? They have a weird accent. The northern Galilean Jews had a weird, now he's the Messiah? Are you kidding me? Right? Why? Because they're judging Jesus, peace be upon him, by their senses. That's one way of knowing something, is from your senses. But again, the senses can deceive us. The second way of knowing something, which is at a higher level, is from the intellect, which is called aql. Right? So, to give you an example, 
of how our senses can truly deceive us. Imam al-Ghazali, who is a great theologian and philosopher in the medieval times, in his book Mishkat al-Anwar, he says, look at the sun. Someone who looks at the sun without intellect may come to the conclusion that the sun is no bigger than a dirham, which is a silver coin. Say, look, it's only about that big, right? But his intellect knows better. His intellect knows better that it appears to be the size of a dirham, but it's millions and millions of miles away, 93 million miles away. Or he says, look at a small boy. He doesn't appear to be changing, but your intellect knows better. He is changing. He's getting older, but you don't perceive it, but you know it's happening. Or say, describe a tree to me. He says, Yo, my, you might say the trunk, the branches, the leaves. Is that it? You say, no. There's also the, uh, the roots, right? He says, well, I can't see the roots, but you know they're there. Your intellect knows better. But with the intellect as well, we find that there's a, uh, a limit. The intellect as well has a jurisdiction. Intellect cannot prove everything. Science cannot prove everything. Science cannot prove morality. Can science prove someone's moral morality over someone else's morality? No, science is fundamentally non-moral, not immoral. Fundam fundamentally non-moral. It doesn't deal with morality. It cannot prove morality. Science cannot prove metaphysical events, things that happened in the past. Can it prove what I did last week? Prove it. No, you cannot reproduce it. You can't prove anything. You can prove, uh, produce evidence, but can you prove it? No, you can't. Science cannot prove human emotion, like love. Can you prove I love someone? Can you prove I hate someone? You can't prove it. So he, he's, he's sweating his heart. How do you know what emotion that is? How do you know what's going on in my heart? You have no idea. Can't prove it. Science cannot prove mathematics. It uses mathematics. It takes it for granted, right? If you claim that science proves mathematics, then you're arguing in a circle. It takes it for granted. So when people look at the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through their aql, through their intellect. Non-Muslims, they have glowing tributes about him because they understand just from intellect, just from their reason that this was a great human being. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, he called the prophet the savior of humanity. Thomas Carlyle, he said that he's my hero prophet. Alphonse de la Martin, in the history of Turkey, 1870, he says that is Muhammad as regards the standards by which all human greatness may be measured. We may well ask, is there any man greater than he? Michael Hart, he wrote a book in 1978. All Muslims know about this book, right? He said that the most influential human being in the history of the world was Muhammad. He's not Muslim, right? This is based on his understanding, on his research, on his aql, on his intellect. Then you have Gandhi, John William Draper, and the list goes on and on and on. That's the second way of knowing. And then there's a third way of knowing, which is called episteme. This is the highest way of knowing. Episteme is a Greek word. It's a compound word. Epi is a preposition, which means to stand, which means to be upon something. And histeme means to stand upon something, right? So the, the, uh, the analogy here, according to Platonic Socrates, is like standing on the top rung of a ladder and having a God's eye view of the world. To see the world, in other words, as it really is. True knowledge. This is called ma'rifa in Arabic. Ma'rifa. And it's by way of hidayah. True gnosis is given by guidance from God. It's only given by guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Ahlul Sufiya, the Sufis, I'm talking about the true Sufis, not the goofy Sufis. They call it al-ilmul laduni. Al-ilmul laduni. Knowledge directly imparted by God through mystic intuition. And there's evidence of this in the Quran. There's a person named Khidr in the Quran who encounters Moses, or vice versa. Moses encounters Khidr. And Moses is a prophet, and he has exalted status. He's a prophet. And he meets this man Khidr. And God describes Khidr by saying, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا That we taught him special knowledge from ourselves. Right? Given either through a ru'ya, a dream, a vision, or ilham, or some sort of inspiration. I'll give you an example of this. And this is, um, and Allahu Alam, whether uh, God knows whether this is a true example of episteme, but it's very, very interesting. Uh, and it wasn't reported, it was only reported by one of the media outlets in Israel, Palestine. There was a rabbi in 2008 whose name was Rabbi Yiksach Kuduri, right? And he died in 2008. He was 108 years old when he died. 
okay? 108 years old when he died. And it, is, it had been his claim the last few years of his life that almost every night he would be visited in his dream by the Messiah, would come to him in his dream, right? And he would have this conversation with the Messiah. And he was declared a tzaddik, this man, Rabbi Yiksa Quduri. Tzaddik means he's basically a great saint of Judaism. He had these visions of the Messiah. And then on one of the visions, the Messiah reveals to him his name. So this is my name. And it was embedded within a statement, right? So he wrote it down. And he told his son, who was an 80-year-old man, he said, when I die, wait one year and then open this and you can read it and you can discover the name of the Messiah, right? <laughs> so Rabbi Kuduri, he died. A year later, his son opened the, this note he had written, which the Messiah revealed his name. And it said in Hebrew, Yarim ha'am v'yoki'ach shodvoro v'toroto umdim. When you read this statement, the translation is, uh, he will raise up the people and he will prove that his word and his law are standing. He will prove that his law and his word is standing. So initially Christians did not like this statement because it seems to slight their understanding of the Torah, that it's been abrogated, right? That it's, uh, we're free from the bondage, the curse of the law, as Paul says in Galatians. We're living in the grace, not that his law is standing, Right? So initially, they didn't like this statement. But then, we can actually extract the name of the Messiah from this statement. You take the first letter of every word, and what do you get? You get Yeshua, Yehoshua, actually. Yehoshua, which is the word for Joshua, but it's also the Hebrew way of saying Jesus. Right? This is how you say Jesus in Hebrew. So after that, many of the Jewish elements, they didn't like this statement as well. But we Muslims have no problem with the statement, right? We have no problems with the statement, Jesus is the Messiah. We believe that, the Quran says so. And the Quran says that Jesus said, that I have come to confirm the essence of the Torah, the law of Moses. Whether that's an example of episteme or not, God, God knows. Just wanted to give you that interesting example. So we have senses, we have aql, and we have episteme. Now, when we deal with aql, with intellect, the questions that we ask are what and how. And when we deal with episteme, true knowledge, we ask the question of why. So I'll give you an example. William Chittick uses this example in his book, The Vision of Islam. He says, imagine you have a painting, like the Mona Lisa or something, and you tell a scientist to talk about this painting. So the scientist, he runs a battery of tests on the painting, because a scientist is oriented towards what, uh, what and how, right? So he'll say, you know, he'll do some carbon-14 test or whatever it is, he'll do some tests on the canvas and on the paint, oh, say this paint is from 15th century Florence, all of these tests describing these minute details about the physical, physicality of, of the painting. But then you ask a small boy, right, what do you think about the painting? And the small boy will say, I wonder what the artist was thinking about when he drew this picture. So my question is, which of these two has a greater understanding as to the mind of the artist? Which of these two is the second one, the boy, right? Because he's asking the question of why, what's the purpose of the painting? And it's the same thing with the universe. When it comes to the universe, we have what and how. What happened? There is a explosion of a primeval atom. How did it happen? Um, Scientists don't really know, but Lawrence Krauss says 13.72 something. I mean, they can date the universe to four decimal points, according to Lawrence Krauss. They can date the age of the universe to four decimal points, 13.7256 billion years, right? But how did it happen? They still don't know how it happened, because how can you get something from nothing, right? That's impossible. When does that happen in nature? How can you get something from nothing, right? So to believe in that, like this, this, there's an atheist named Daniel Dennett who said that the universe came from nothing, for nothing, by nothing. Right? Which is an interesting statement because that's worse than believing in magic. Right? Because if I pull a rabbit out of my hat, I'm still producing something in its real magic, let's say. It's not an illusion. It's not sleight of hand. Let's just say I produce a rabbit out of my hat. 
I'm still producing something from something. Thin air is something. It's certainly not nothing, right? When we talk about nothing, we're talking about the, the absence of being. Aristotle said nothing is what stones dream about. What do stones dream about? Nothing, right? How do you get a universe out of nothing? So they don't know how this happened, right? So ultimately, they're going to make a metaphysical claim. So it, Daniel Dennett says, the same atheist, he says, a universe in an unbelievable act pulled itself up by its own bootstraps. Can you pull yourself off the ground by your bootstraps? No, it's impossible. That's a miracle. It's a metaphysical claim. Either way you slice it, we all make metaphysical types of claims. How do you reconcile infinite regression? Because it used to be that the universe was infinite in the past. Right? This was the standard model of the universe. That it was chaos and, it's, uh, and it has negative infinitude. And then God at some point turned the chaos into cosmos, into order. No one believes in this anymore. This is an old world view, an old cosmology. Right? Infinite, but that doesn't solve infinite regression, right? There has to be a primary cause. For example, if there's someone standing in front of me, and I say to him, I'm going to give you a hug, right? But first I have to ask this guy behind me. Can I give him a hug? He says, hold on, let me ask the guy behind me, right? And he says, hold on, let me ask the guy behind me. 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 Guy behind me. And this goes on ad infinitum like what they used to believe. The universe is eternal in the past. There's no beginning. Will I ever hug the man? I'll never hug him. So when you ask the question, then who created the creator? That's tantamount to disbelieving in the existence of a universe. There's something here. Eventually I hug the man. Eventually there was a universe. How can you traverse an infinite number of events? It's philosophically and rationally impossible to traverse a negative infinitude. There had to have been a space-time beginning, a cosmogenesis, where space and time and materiality came into being. Who has the ability to do that? One who is necessarily spaceless, timeless, and immaterial, and apparently extremely powerful, right? This is a simple answer. This is how we can philosoph. This is called the kalam, cosmological argument that Christian and Muslim philosophers have used uh, since the Middle Ages. A philosophical argument that proves that God creates ex nihilo, out of nothing. Right. <clears throat> so this is to make a long story short. The, in, the the atheist or the scientist will tell you what is the universe, and he'll give you an idea of how it happened, but he can't tell you why it happened. This is where episteme comes into play. Episteme, ma'rifa, the highest type of knowledge. Why did it happen? This comes from God. This comes from hidayah, from guidance uh, from God. It's like one of my teachers, Abdullah bin Bayah, who's a great contemporary scholar, uh, wrote a letter to extremist Muslims, right? And he said, he said to them, ta'lamuna ma yaqulu rabbukum wa la ta'lamuna li ma yaqulu rabbukum. He said, you know what your Lord said, you know what he said, but you don't know why he said it. Anyone can quote the Quran and justify anything. I can quote the Bible and justify the killing of anything, of children, massacre. I can quote anything and make it look like a terrible book. I can quote Thomas Aquinas and make him look like a uh, homicidal maniac. I can quote Augustine of Hippo. I can, anyone can quote anything. But the question is, what is the per why was that verse, what is the context that's the most important thing. This is a higher level of, of understanding. So let's look at some of the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These are statements of the Prophet, rigorously authenticated. All Muslims believe in the statements of the Prophet. Most Muslims have heard of them, but I'm guessing that most non-Muslims have not heard of them. So when we're dealing with the Prophet, the verse of the Quran that is kind of our anchor is in chapter 21 of the Quran, verse number 107. In which it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ And this answers the question of why was the Prophet sent. We did not send thee except as a mercy unto all the worlds. He was sent as a mercy to all the worlds. الْعَالَمِينَ is كُلُّ مَا سِوَى اللَّهِ 
is everything in existence except for God. He was sent to everything. He's a cosmopolitan shepherd. This is the greatest demonstration of God's mercy. And Aquinas, for example, Christian philosopher, will say the same thing about Jesus. Because Aristotle said that it's impossible, right? Aristotle was a deist, so to speak, that it's impossible for God to truly love man because they're not the same genus, right? Like, he'll, he'll argue that you don't really love your dog, do you? You don't really love him. You might claim, I, lo I love my dog. But do you really love your dog? He'll say, no, you can't love your dog. You're not, he's not a human being. So how do you bridge this gap? How do you bridge the gap, right? You bridge the gap, according to Aquinas, by God becoming a man and becoming the genus of a man, right? In Islam, the gap is bridged by God sending messengers that he does not need to send. It is an act of mercy and love. There's nothing compulsory upon God, right? So when we talk, when we talk about God as a primary cause or the first cause, some of the theologians, they don't like calling him that because they say in your mind, when you think of a cause, you automatically attribute to that cause an effect. There's cause and then there's a necessary effect. If you're going to talk about God as a cause, you should know or detach this idea that he must necessarily affect something. He doesn't need to affect anything unless he chooses to. God is a free agent. He's al-fa'il, as Imam al-Ghazali calls him. So, this hadith is in Musnad Ahmad. The Prophet said, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم, الرَّحِمُونَ يَرْحَمُهُمُ الرَّحْمَانِ That God shows mercy to those who show mercy. Show mercy to those on earth, and the one in heaven will show you mercy. This hadith is taught to children at five years old. It's called Hadith al Rahma, the Hadith of Mercy. This is the hadith that sets the foundation of their Islamic education. There's 23 links in the chain of this hadith, all the way back to the Prophet. 23 links that go back 1400 years. It's a sound, rigorously authenticated hadith. Show mercy to those on earth, and the one in heaven will show you mercy. This is what children learn at five years old. Another hadith. The Prophet said, لا تدخل جنة حتى تؤمنوا ولا تؤمنوا حتى تحبوا You will not enter paradise until you truly believe, and you will not truly believe until you love one another. Right? Love one another. And he said to his disciples or uh, companions, Shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? And they said, yes. And he said, Afshu salama baynakum. Spread peace amongst yourselves. Love and peace. Fundamentals of Islam. In case you didn't know. Another hadith. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayyuhan nas, afshu salama wa at'imu ta'ama wa silul arhama wa sallu bil layli wa nasu niyam tadkhul jannata bi salam. He said, oh people, spread peace, feed one another, maintain ties of kinship, and pray in the night when others are asleep, and you will enter paradise in peace. The person who related this hadith was a rabbi in Medina named Abdullah ibn Salam. Another hadith. La yu'minu, la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yakuna, hatta yuhibba, hatta yuhibba li akhihi, ma yuhibba li, li nafsi, aw kama qala. He said, none of, you none of you believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself, right? And the commentators of hadith are unanimous that when he said brother here, he's not simply talking about your Muslim brother. He's talking about your brother or sister in all of humanity, that you prefer others over yourself. This is called alt altruism. In Arabic, it's called ithar, right? Imam Nawawi, he commented on his hadith, and he said, this means... Love for humanity, brother and sister, put them above yourself. One time Imam Nawawi, he was walking down the street, the same man who commented on this hadith, he was a great scholar of hadith. He's walking down the street and a thief ran up behind him and snatched his bag and, and took off running. So the Imam, what does he do? He starts running after him. He, this is an old man. He says, running after the thief. And he's shouting at the thief. He says, please ask me for it. Ask me for it. And he says, what? The thief says, what? Ask me for that. And he says, can I have this? He says, yes. And he stops running. Right? He didn't want him to be punished by the authorities. He didn't want him to 
be punished by God because he's stealing from a scholar. He prefers others over himself. This is called ithar, altruism. This is the teaching of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another hadith, لَيْسَ الْمُؤْمِنُ بِالَّذِي يَشْبَعُوا وَجَارُهُ إِلَى جَنْبِهِ جَائِعٌ He is not a Muslim or a true believer uh, who goes to bed satiated while his neighbor is hungry. Right? This is in Bukhari. The Prophet, when he was living in Mecca, he had a neighbor who was a woman who did not like him. And every morning she would put, his, she would put her filth on his doorstep. So every morning when he would leave his house and it was still dark, he would go to the mosque and worship. He would have to cross over and move this filth out of his doorstep. Now one day the filth wasn't there. So now he's concerned. Now he's concerned about her. Right? The filth is not there. Now he's asking, where's, that, where's this woman? Is she okay? Right? She didn't leave any filth on my doorstep. So he finds out that she is very ill and about to pass away. So he goes and visits her. And this touches her heart and she becomes Muslim and she passes away. Right? So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, Gabriel exhorted me to be so kind to my neighbor that I thought he would command me to make my neighbor my successor. Right? This is how much the love of neighbors is important. Like Rabbi Akiva said in the second century, he said, uh, Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. That is the entire Torah, and everything else is commentary. <clears throat> Another hadith, the Prophet said, Yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tunafiru. He said, facilitate things for people. Make them easy for people. Don't make things difficult. Give people glad tidings, and don't drive them away from you. Right? So we talk, we talk about you know, Islamic law. A lot. Muslims have to pray, they have to fast, so on and so forth. We fast during the month of Ramadan, 30, 29 or 30 day fast. There's a story, of, there's a hadith of the Prophet when he was living in Medina. A man came to him and said, O Messenger of God, I intentionally broke my fast during Ramadan. I couldn't help myself. And it was one of the first few days of Ramadan. Right? Uh, so I broke my fast. And according to Islamic law, there's a kafara, there's an expiation you have to pay if you break your fast intentionally. Right? So the Prophet said to him, you have to fast 60 consecutive days now. And he said, I, I can't even fast five days, and I couldn't control myself. So the Prophet said, can you afford to free a slave? He said, no, I can't afford that. So then the Prophet said to him, uh, you have to feed 60 people. He said, I have nothing. Feed, feed what? I don't have anything. So the Prophet himself, he goes out and purchases a large basket of dates and gives it to the man and says, here, take this and feed people with it. And the man says, who, feed who? And the Prophet says, al-fuqara, the poor people, go give it to the poor people. And then he says, O Messenger of God, wallahi, I swear to God, nobody is more poor in the city of Medina except my own wife and kids, my own family. There's no one more poor the Prophet laughed and he said, take this and give it to your family. Right? So this is justice being meted out of him by the Prophet ﷺ. You break the law, you're going to get punished. Right? This is the Prophet ﷺ fulfilling this man's kafara, his expiation for breaking the law. Um, another hadith. This is a hadith of the Prophet that he uttered during the farewell pilgrimage, Hajjatul Wada, in front of over 100,000 people, one of the last things, one of the last sermons he ever made, he made sure that there was hundreds of thousands of people that were there to record his statement, right, and to remember what he had said. Istausu bin nisa'i khaira. Treat women well. Treat women well. A man came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, ayu nas ahabu ilayk. O oh, Messenger of God, who do you love the most from, un, from amongst the people? So, and he said, Aisha. Qala Aisha, his wife, right? And according to the Arab culture at that time, it was seen as sort of uncouth to admit that you love your wife, right? It wasn't seen as quite chivalrous or you know, manly to admit that you love. Of course, you love your wife, but you would go into the tent and say, you know, honey, I love you. But to say it out in the open like that, right? So he's breaking this cultural norm. And he's using her first name, which is something the Arabs did not do either. Aisha. 
right? He loves his wife. When his daughter Fatima used to come into his gathering, his little daughter Fatima, when she was very young, he used to rise from his seat, right? And he used to kiss her on the hands and on the forehead. I heard from a Muslim one time, I was in a mosque a couple of years ago, my daughter ran up to me, I grabbed her and I, and I hugged her. And he said to me, what are you doing? He said, astaghfirullah, may God forgive me. What are you doing? I said, well, what's wrong, brother? He said, if my father saw you do that, he'd beat you with a stick. I said, why? Back home in our country, we don't even look at our daughters. Really? You don't look at your daughter? The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who is best of creation, according to our prophetology, when his daughter Fatima entered the room, he would rise from his seat. A little girl walked into the room, kiss her on the hands, kiss her on the forehead. He used to pass his hand over small children who were playing in the street, touch the tops of their heads and bless them, make dua for them. And he would greet them first. It was very hard to preempt the greeting of the Prophet. He would say salam to you before you even knew he was there, right? Al-Badi'u bis salami bari'u min al-kibr. The person who initiates the salam alaykum, the person who initiates the greeting, is free from arrogance. This is what he said. And he would not let, let go of your hand unless you let go of his hand, right? And he used to talk to children by getting down and looking at them eye level instead of looming over them and intimidating them. It was a huge man, right? He would get down and look at them eye level. He used to play with his grandsons. One time he was kissing his grandsons. He kissed his grandson on the cheek in this tough Bedouin Arab, right? And the, the Bedouin were very rough around the edges. The Prophet said, whoever lives in the desert becomes harsh, becomes gruff, right? So this Bedouin saw him kissing his grandson. He said, you kiss your sons? You kiss your grandson? And the Prophet said, naam, yes. And he said, I have 10 sons and I've never kissed a single one of them. And he was so proud of this fact. I've never kissed a single one of my sons. And the Prophet said, there's nothing in my religion for those who don't have any mercy in their hearts. There's nothing in my religion for those who have no mercy in their hearts, right? So this is how he was with, with children. Another hadith, he says, at'imul ja'ir, wa'udul marida, wa'fukul aniya. He said, this is Bukhari, and Abu Dawood, he said, feed the hungry, visit the sick, and free the slaves. He said, according to his wife, Aisha, and who knows a man better than his wife, right? So this next hadith is not reported by a male companion who might have seen him once a month or once a week or something, or in public places, but never in private. This is his wife, Aisha, who grew up in his household when, uh, when she was eight, nine, 10 years old. She's been in his household. And Imam Ali reports the same hadith, almost verbatim. And he was also raised in the household of the Prophet. She says, مَا ضَرَبَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِيَدِهِ شَيْئًا قَطْ وَلَا ضَرَبَ خَادِمًا وَلَا إِمْرَأَةً In another translation, uh, or another transmission, وَلَا وَلَدًا She says, the Prophet Muhammad did not strike anything with his hand did not strike anything with his hand, did not strike a woman, did not strike a servant, did not strike a child. This is what his wife says. Who knows better than his wife? The Quran says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of God a beautiful pattern of conduct. He said, peace be upon him, لَا تَتَّخِذُوا ظُهُورَ دَوَابِكُمْ مَنَابِرًا He said, don't take the back of your beasts as pulpits, right? In other words, don't sit on your camel, don't sit on your donkey or your horse and start pontificating about things, right? Dismount and then you can talk because it hurts the back of the animal. So animal rights. He said, Don't curse the rooster. Why? Because he wakes you up for prayer. <laughs> don't curse the, we don't hear a lot of roosters around here, do we? But in pre-modern times, we'd hear roosters right at the time of suhoor, just before the dawn prayer. Another hadith, Aisha relates, لَمْ يَكُنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَاحِشًا وَلَا مُتَفَاحِشًا That the Prophet was not crude and did not engage in crude language. وَلَا سَخَّابًا فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ He did not raise his voice in the marketplace, which is very interesting, because a lot of Muslim scholars, 
They'll look for Mohammedan typologies in the Old Testament, very much like Christian scholars do with Isa alayhi salam, with, with Jesus. They'll look at prophecies, Christological typologies in the Old Testament, and say that these are fulfilled by Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 42, we're told of a slave of God who's the chosen one of God, and it describes him by saying, Lo yashmi aqawlo bi that he will not raise his voice in the marketplace. Right? So Aisha says this, Wala sakhaban fil aswaq. Wala yajzi bisayati sayya. He will not return an evil for an evil. That's what she says. The Prophet did not return an evil for an evil. Walakin ya'afu wa yasfahu. But he would forgive and overlook. The Prophet said, La dorara wa la dirar. There is neither facilitating harm nor reciprocating harm. Do not facilitate harm, and if harm is done to you, do not reciprocate harm. Right? This is what he said. We all know this famous story. The Muslims know it quite well. Of one time, a Bedouin, again, they're kind of rough around the edges. He comes into the mosque in Medina and begins to relieve himself. Right? And the hadith says, Faqama nasu ilayhi. The people got up and they were going to attack him in mid urination, which is a big no no. Right? So the Prophet said, Da'uhu, leave him. And he said, No, turn around and yeah, yeah, leave, leave him alone. So then the Prophet himself approaches the man and he says, Ya akhil Arab. Right? He's, Oh, my Arab brother. He's trying to make a connection with him. So, you know, these are places of worship and reading of the Quran and remembrance of God. We don't do things in here. And the man honestly didn't know. So he washed himself and he prayed with the Muslims and he became Muslim. Right? Because the Prophet showed him this uh, gentleness, this rifq. Right? In the Quran, we are told that God tells Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and to speak to him, qawlan layyinan. Speak to him with mild words to Pharaoh. Who on earth is worse than Pharaoh? Nobody. Who on earth is better than Moses? Nobody. Right? One time the Prophet was in Medina and he was walking with Aisha. And there was, at times in Medina, there was some animosity between uh, Jewish elements and the Arabs. Right? They're walking past a group of Jews. And one of the Jewish men who passed by the Prophet, he said, Samu alaykum. Right? Very quickly. Sounds like Salamu alaykum. But Samu alaykum means may death be upon you. Instead of Salamun alaykum, may peace be upon you. So Aisha immediately jumps all over the guy and says, Wa alaykum wa lanatullah wa ghadaballah. Right? And upon you and the curse of God and the wrath of God. Right? So the Prophet looks at her and says, Ya Aisha, alayki bir rifq. Oh Aisha, I exhort you to have gentleness. I exhort you to have gentleness. Wa iyaki wal unf wal fuhush. And I warn you not to have violence or harsh language. Right? So then she says, Oh Messenger of God, she thought maybe he didn't hear what they said. Maybe he thought that they said, Salamu alaykum. Right? So she said, didn't you hear what they said? And he said, didn't you hear what I said? Right? So he's setting, he's the teacher. He's making the example. That's important. There's a hadith of Anas ibn Malik, one of the companions of the Prophet, where he says that there was a boy in Medina whose bird had died. His pet bird. It was a bulbul, a nightingale. Right? And this boy was just inconsolable. You know, like children, they love pets. And then when the pet dies, they're just, you know, for a couple of days, they're just inconsolable, right? So the Prophet heard about this, and he said, I have to visit him. Now, if you think about this, the Prophet, from a, from a temporal perspective, is the head of state in Medina, right? He's got so much on his plate, and he's going to visit a boy whose bird died, right? From a spiritual standpoint, he's the Prophet of God. He is the best of creation. But he goes and visits this boy, and he says to the boy, Ya Aba Umer, ma fa'ala nughair. Oh, father of Umer. The bird's name was Umer, apparently. What did the bird used to do? Tell me about the bird. And then the boy said, well, he used to sing this song, and he used to chirp in the morning. You know, it's therapeutic, right? So he used to visit children who were sick. This was not, he didn't say, oh, I'm, I'm the messenger of God. Well, what do you think, I'm going to go visit some boy, right? He didn't consider it above, uh, below him. 
The Prophet, peace be upon him, had compassion for everything and for everyone. And this is evident in many hadith. One time they were traveling to a place um, with a group of his companions and there was a shortage of food. There was very little food. And a companion named Abdullah ibn Mughaffal al-Muzani, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he found this piece of meat, right? A small piece of meat that he had, and he puts it under his arm like this, right? So he gets down low to the ground, and he says, لا أعطي أحدا منها الشيء. And he just says it under his breath. I'm not going to share this with anybody. I'm not going to share this with anyone, right? And then he said he looked up and at a distance away, several, several yards away, it was impossible for him to have heard him. He sees the Prophet looking at him. And the Prophet is smiling at him. And it's a disapproving smile. Right? And you can tell the Prophet was angry. How can you tell the Prophet was angry? One time Sayyidina Umar was reading something. And he looked up and the Prophet was angry. So he, he dropped what he was reading. They asked Umar, how did you know he was angry? And Umar said, he was smiling. What? He was smiling? He said, yes. Because the Prophet, when he would get angry, unlike us, when we get angry, we start cussing, we start throwing things, we start beating up people, right? We start acting like tyrants. No, no, no. When he got angry, his face would turn slightly red. There would be a vein protruding in the middle of his forehead, and he would smile. This is how he got angry. Did not raise his voice, right? So Abdullah ibn Mughafal al-Muzani, he sees the Prophet smiling at him, a disapproving smile. So he called five other men. And they all shared this little piece of meat that he had found, right? So the Prophet has uh, concern for his ummah even to that degree. According to descriptions of the Prophet, he's described as mutawasil al-ahzan, that he had the appearance of being grief-stricken, right? And so the scholars of hadith, they elaborate on this, and they say that in his isolation or in his solitude, Right? When he was by himself, he had the appearance like he was grieving, but he was not grieving. He was contemplating. He was very contemplative. He was raptured. This is called istighraq. He was absorbed in the presence of his Lord. Right? He was very contemplative. And then it says that when he was with the people, kanadaiman bishra. But when he was with his people, he was always smiling and laughing. And this is one of his names, at dahak the laughing prophet. The Quran says, You're almost killing yourself with grief over them because they won't believe. He had great concern for people. The Quran says, And there's no taqsis in this verse. There's no specification that this is only for believers. He says, There has come unto you all a messenger. It grieves him that you should perish. Deeply concerned is he about you. I want to tell you a story by way of comparison. So in the book of 2 Kings, in the Old Testament, we're told a story of a Hebrew prophet named Elisha. Okay? He's a Hebrew prophet, according to uh, Judaism and Christianity. He's believed to be a prophet. His name is Elisha. Right? Elisha is going up to a place called Bethel. And as he's going up, uh, a group of boys begin following him. And the, the Hebrew says, very small boys. And the boys, they start making fun of him. They start saying to him, Alei qari'ah in Hebrew. Alei qari'ah, that means go, baldy. He has a bald spot. Get going, baldy. Hurry up, baldy. So Elisha, a prophet of God, what does he do? He supplicates and curses them in the name of God. Then what happens? These two bears, bears, come out of the forest and they completely rip apart 42 young boys for making fun of a prophet's bald spot. Right? Apparently he's very, very sensitive. We look at the prophet Muhammad wasallam. He went to a city called the Ta'if, right? Outside of Mecca to call the people to Islam. He was rejected by the people. He was stoned out of the city by the slaves and the children. And they were punching him. His feet were covered in blood. He lost consciousness, pushing him down, kicking him, spitting on him. Right? He collapsed under a tree in an orchard. And we're told, according to our traditions, that 
the angel of wrath descended and said, Oh, messenger of God, give me the word and we will destroy the city. Right? And what did he say? min aslabihim. No, I have hope in their descendants. If they're not going to accept it, maybe their descendants will. Stoned out of the city, bleeding, unconscious, did not seek retribution, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the day of the conquest of Mecca, I highly recommend people to read the biography of the Prophet. Read about how he used to treat his enemies. Right? The conquest of Mecca, people that had fought against him for years and years and years and years. Over 23 years, constantly trying to kill him and have killed many of his companions and family members. Right? He forgave them on that day. La tathriba alaykum al yom. There's no blemish on you today. There was a woman named Hind bintu Utba who at a battle called Uhud cannibalized the Prophet's uncle Hamza. Cut off his uh, nose and ears, made a necklace, split open his belly, took out his liver, took a bite of it. This woman, Hind bintu Utba, she did this. And Hamza was very beloved to the Prophet. He was only three years older than the Prophet. He's like his brother. He loved him. This same woman comes to the Prophet on the day of Fatha Mecca, on the conquest of Mecca. And she's completely veiled. And she says to the Prophet, Praise be to the one who made his religion victorious. And the Prophet says, Man ant, who are you? And she says, This is Hind bint Utba. And he says, What? Kill her. Marhaban. Welcome. Marhaban. This was his response, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. There's many, many examples of this. The Quran says, Idfa' billati hi ahsan. Repel evil with that which is better. Repel evil with beauty. Right? This is a great Quranic imperative. So the question is then, if all of these things are true, then why haven't we heard about them? Right? I mean, we always hear about Jesus on the cross saying, Pater, afes, autois, Father, forgive them. Right? Even though most, by the way, most New Testament scholars don't believe that Jesus actually said that. That was a later addition to the text. Nonetheless, we hear about it all the time. That doesn't mean Jesus wasn't merciful. Of course he was. This particular text, according to the majority of textual critics, is not an authentic verse from the Gospel of Luke. But nonetheless, we hear it all the time. But we don't hear any of these things about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the level of misinformation staggers me. And I'll end with this, inshallah, then we can eat. And I think later we're going to have a Q&A. So I gave a talk one time at a university to students of, to master's degree students, people going for their master's in, in religious studies, like Christian spirituality, uh, getting their MDivs. One of the questions I got from a doctoral student, doctoral student, she said, why do Muslims worship Muhammad? I said, what? I said, wait a minute, do, do you think we worship Muhammad? She said, no, why do you worship? So we, don't, we don't worship Muhammad. So you don't? Right? So this is something that's just, just so amazing to me, that the foundation of Islamic theology is that there's nothing worthy of worship whatsoever. Nothing worthy of worship except God, except the creator of everything. No one else is worthy of worship. Nothing in creation has any intrinsic power in and of itself except God, right? But this is someone who's going to, is almost a doctor of religion. Imagine the average Joe Schmo on the street. What is he thinking about Islam? What's his perception about it? What is he thinking about Muslims? What, what Muslims believe? What Muslims, what, what their quote unquote agenda is in this country? Things like that. It's really scary stuff. So uh, I hope that I might have shed a little bit of light on some things and maybe cause you to think about a few things as well in a different way. Um, so at, at this point, I think I'm going to, because it's past seven now, and we're scheduled to have dinner. So uh, kind of let that marinate a little bit <laughs> while you're eating, and you can speak amongst yourselves. And if you have any questions or comments, I'll be more than happy to, I think we're gonna, I'm going to come back up after dinner and we can do some Q&A, and I'd like to hear from you as well, um, inshallah. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.